12 years ago on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, a fire swept through the facility at that time that was built on this hillside for the church to gather. And the first responders and the firefighters were fantastic that day. Um, they came here and worked tirelessly um, to put out the fire to keep the fire from spreading to nearby homes and uh, other structures on the property. In fact, there are some of those that uh, were here at the first service and are here this morning, and we are grateful. The damage from the fire and the smoke in the water uh, to extinguish the fire was so great that some difficult decisions had to be made, and eventually we felt it was best to just tear down the existing structure that was there, the main part of the, the church building, including the worship center and the educational spaces. And then there were some difficult decisions that had to be made uh, after that about the future. But with tragedy comes opportunity. And I've been speaking to you this year about this is a year of opportunity. And maybe in your life right now, you're going through a very difficult time. It may seem very dark and you're thinking, what am I going to do? Where am I going to turn? And I just want you to know you're not alone. There are many others who have gone through various kinds of tragedies, disasters, difficulties who have felt that way. But I'm here to proclaim to you that God is good and he is faithful and he will help you through that time if you will call upon him, if you will seek that help and be open to the various ways that he brings it. So we had an opportunity to build again on this property and to make better use of the existing land. So we even made the difficult decision to tear down some perfectly good buildings and structures so that we could be open to the new way that God wanted to minister to this community and share the good news of Jesus Christ working through his people. Now, one of the things that we experienced as we went through that time of difficulty and through that time of tragedy was God working through people. It's how he, it's how he works. He absolutely works supernaturally beyond what we can do as human beings, but he absolutely wants to incorporate us as part of his creation to be his hands, his feet, his voice, to carry out his will. In fact, that's what Jesus uh, came to, to teach and to illustrate to us. So during that time, there were other churches that helped out, Montgomery Community Church in Cincinnati. There was a connection here between some of our members and uh, some family that was at that church. And though they had gone through a time where a tornado had gone through Cincinnati and greatly damaged their church a few years earlier, and they were still in the rebuilding process themselves, they took up a special Sunday morning offering and gave us over $5,000. That was just incredible. And it was such an encouragement to us during that time because we thought, wow, they are going through a tough time and here they are reaching out to us. So God used that to strengthen us and to encourage us. And it wasn't just them, the American Baptist Churches of Ohio, which we are a part of, other American Baptist churches throughout the state, they uh, gave us some donations and some money to help with various costs through that time. And then if that were not enough, even St. Ambrose Catholic Church, just right across the road from us here, every year they would uh, do a spaghetti fundraising dinner for their own costs and ministries that they were doing. But that particular year, they took the entire proceeds from their spaghetti fundraising dinner that was normally for them, and they gave Porterfield the entire amount. Can, can you imagine? Now, this is God at work. And I, I, honestly, I don't mean this any disrespectfully or trying to be funny. But, you know, when God can take, you know, Roman Catholics and say, we're going to help the Baptists, something's up with that. You know, God's hand is in that. And, and we still are greatly appreciative. Because, again, it's all about the one who we worship and serve, the one who has saved us. It's all about Jesus Christ. He is who we worship. He is the center of everything. And when we keep our focus right and when that's our message, then I do believe that it makes it more clear and then other people are more willing to come on board, though there will always be those who, who will not. But it, it didn't even stop there. So that was wonderful through the church in the mid Ohio Valley and beyond across the state. We got help. But then Warren High School, they were willing to open up their facility. This is the fire happened uh, midweek, that week's when St. Patrick's Day fell 
um, that particular year. And I reached out to Warren High School and contacted their administrators and they were kind enough. I said, could we need to meet and worship? So we, can we come and meet at the high school? We, our congregation would like to come out to the high school and use your auditorium. And they were wonderful. They said, yes, absolutely. And they opened up the school to us. And we met there for several weeks. And then when that uh, wasn't quite adequate and we needed more space to have a facility that had some nursery facilities for younger children, we contacted West Virginia University at Parkersburg because they had the daycare area. And so we worked that out with them and they helped us out and we did pay rent, but again, they were very gracious to us and let us use their facility. So this is God working through people in the Mid-Ohio Valley and God was showing that he was hearing our prayers, that he does care, he is concerned. This spring will mark the 10th year anniversary of the very first worship service we held right here in this room this spring 10 years ago. For those of you that have been with us on that journey, that seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? And in some ways it was. But it's also amazing to think how far God has brought us because since that time of that first worship gathering in this room, uh, we've been able to uh, do an expansion to our facility because God has been blessing the work here and the church continues to grow and we want to continue to reach out and to be a blessing to the community. It's one of the things that we were feeling in our heart, but as we built this facility, we didn't want to just keep the facility for ourselves, though it is absolutely built. And I wanna make this clear, this facility is absolutely built for the sole purpose to honor Jesus Christ. This facility is built to worship God and to honor Jesus Christ above all else, first of all. In so doing, though, we want to be a blessing to the community. So there are other folks who come in under the grace of God and the grace of Christ because we want to extend the love of God to them in a very practical way. And that's what I want to speak with you about today and have you to, to think about. When I think about all that God has done for us through us uh, since that time, I think about what the Holy Spirit spoke to David as he penned many of the Psalms or the songs that are recorded for us in the Old Testament. And one of the Psalms is Psalm 50. And just one of the really short passages says this, offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high. And then I love this, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. And that's what I'm doing here today. It's what I do every day. We are so grateful that God honored this verse and he honored this promise. We called upon him in the day of trouble. And there were many more dynamics that I'm not gonna take the time to go into to today. It's not necessary to go into today. But there were so many challenges during that time and even since that time. But overall, God heard our prayer and we are here today to give testimony to that and to give praise and to glorify God because that's what this scripture says. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. And of course, we're to have then an attitude of thanksgiving even as we approach God. Notice it says, pay your vows to the most high. It means when you give yourself to the Lord or you make a determination of something you wanna do for God, then follow through with that. Honor him with that obedience. And so, not to go into the whole thing of what vows were in the Old Testament, but just that principle there, when, when you tell God that you really want to do something for him, then have the faith to follow through. And that's what has happened here, because as we cried out for help, our goal was, Lord, we want to rebuild, we want to honor you, we want to continue to serve you and to share the gospel of Christ with this community and around the world. And so he has helped us to do that. But notice the way that this little short passage ends is, uh, after he says, I will deliver you, he says this, and you shall glorify me. And I am here today, again, to glorify God. I give him all the glory, all the praise, all the thanksgiving. In fact, when anybody comes to me, whether it's other pastors or people from the community, and maybe they have not heard of the church or they've heard of us, but they've never been here before and they walk through the doors, many of them, they look around and they say, wow, this is a beautiful church. And I immediately say, we are so grateful to God for all that he has brought us through. And I use it as a testimony. I tell them of what I'm telling you today, how God worked through many different people. People here in this church, some of you are still here today and I'm grateful 
for each one of you, especially those who have been with us through that whole journey. There's many who were with us back then that have since passed on. They've gone into glory. I'm grateful for their lives and the legacy that they uh, ha have put before us. But God has worked through everyone. But I'm quick to point out that God has worked through many, many people. And so again, he's the one that gets the glory, but I'm appreciative of each one who has been faithful to your calling and giftedness in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And here's what I want you to hear today, because yeah, we, we're gonna glance back for a moment in the rear view mirror, but we don't drive down the highway looking in the rear view mirror. We just glance back to see what's behind us, but we gotta keep our eyes ahead. And here's the thing, God is not finished with us yet, amen. We've got a lot more that he has in store for us. He brought us through that for the future things that he wants us to do. And that's why we're continually praying about the vision that God would have for us in the future. There is a principle that God teaches us in his word. And I, I can just say it very succinctly with a simple phrase. And that phrase is this, blessed to be a blessing blessed to be a blessing. So help me out. I don't often ask you to do this, but would you humor me a little bit? Because I want to make sure that you, that is the one thing that is in your mind when you leave today. If you don't remember anything else, I would like for you to remember this phrase and then think about what it means for you in your life. Blessed to be a blessing. Here we go. One, two, three. Blessed to be a blessing. Now, where do I get that from the Bible, well, I'll tell you, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see it very clearly stated by God in his promise to Abraham. It says this in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. It begins with God placing a calling on Abraham's life. God chose him and said, I want to do a special work through you and but I need you to do this. I need you to trust me. And I'm going to ask you to move from where you are comfortable and you're going to need to learn to trust me every day because I'm not going to tell you the whole plan all at once and I'm not going to tell you immediately where I'm going to take you. I'm asking you to trust me right now on this journey. And every day I want you to trust me. And as you do that, I'm going to take you to a land I will show you. So that's the first thing for you and I right now in our life, in our situation, God may not be asking you to literally move geographically from your home and go somewhere else. But what I can tell you is God challenges every single one of us to be willing to leave our place of comfort, whether it's an attitude or a mindset, something that we've grown up with that we haven't really thought about and we've just taken it because it's what everybody else told us. God wants to personally speak to you and he does that through his word and through his Holy Spirit, and he wants you to learn to listen to him. And then he will take you on this journey, wherever it is for you, that he, he wants you to go in your service for God as a follower of Christ. Now, he ultimately all wants us to be in relationship with him and, and with him forever in heaven. That's the ultimate destination. But there is a journey in this process, and there are some places that only you can go to represent him. There are some people that only you can represent that others cannot because of your personality, your giftedness, your knowledge, your connections, all of that. So you're going to be able to reach people that I could never reach or anyone else around you. That's why we need to be willing, first of all, to hear this call that God places on our life and then respond by faith. Now that was the challenge that God gave to Abraham, but now listen to what he told him. Here's the promise that went with that. If you will trust me by faith, and if you'll follow me to this land that I'm going to show you, I will make you a great nation. At that time, when God spoke to Abraham, he had no children. His wife, Sarah, was barren. She could not have children. They were up in years. And so this must have really kind of taken Abraham aback. But this is how God works. He wants us to trust him, even when sometimes the things he asks us to do seem unlikely or maybe impossible by our standards. Now, here's what God said to him. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a what? A blessing. There it is. I am blessing you, and I want to use you then to be a blessing to others. Blessed to be a blessing. This is how God works in our lives. He doesn't want us to just be selfish with the blessings. Absolutely, he wants us to enjoy them. That's why he gives them to us. 
but he wants us to not become so self-centered and self-focused with those blessings. He wants us to be willing to share. He says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Blessed to be a blessing. So the blessing wasn't just going to stop with people around Abraham or people of that day, but all the families of the earth. Now, how did that happen? What did God mean by that? Well, we're on this side of history now, able to look back after many generations and we can see how God fulfilled the promise that he had given to Abraham because eventually Abraham and Sarah were able to have a child and it was a son and they named him Isaac. And this was miraculous because again, Sarah was very old at that time, but God had promised she alone would be the one through whom this child would be born. Though Abraham had another child with a concubine, he was not the son of promise because God had promised it would be Sarah who would bear him this, this son. And so God fulfilled that promise. Isaac, in turn, later got married and had a child, uh, had more than one child, but there was a particular child named Jacob who God chose out of this heritage, this line of him fulfilling this promise, how God blessed Abraham, make his name great, nation great, and also would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So Jacob, as he learned to trust God, was later renamed Israel. Jacob slash Israel had 12 sons among other children. And of those 12 sons, they got married, have family. And the descendants of those 12 sons became the 12 tribes, literally tribes of Israel. And then as they continued to multiply and grow, they literally became a great nation. And they were recognized as a nation. And that's a lot of the story. In fact, it's the entire story we see in the Old Testament. How God's plan for the entire world began with his promises through certain individuals, and particularly in this case, Abraham, and then through Abraham, the nation of Israel, and then through Israel to bless the whole world. So where do we go from there? Well, out of that nation of Israel, God said, I'm going to enter the world. I'm going to send an anointed one. It's going to be me, really, in the flesh. When we, when we read all these things, these mysteries about who is this Messiah, this anointed one who's going to come, we find out it's God himself visits us. And Jesus Christ came into the world, born of the Virgin Mary, who was of the nation of Israel. So even though... Jesus had no human father. God was his father. This was a miraculous birth. Mary was a virgin. She was of the nation of Israel. So we see in Christ Jesus now how this fulfillment that all the families of the earth would be blessed through this initial promise of Abraham. Again, we could spend a long time talking about this and studying it, but I don't want you to miss the main principle, which is blessed to be a, that's it. So you got it, if, if you got that. But we see it so succinctly worded here. It's what God said. Now, when Christ came into the world, he expounded on that. And so he taught it in some various ways. He said that we are saved from our sins so that we can serve. We can be a servant and we can help others. In fact, we have been helped so that we can be a helper. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16 in the New Testament says, Do not neglect to do good to share what you have, for with such sacrifices, they are pleasing to God. Such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This morning, Lori Price is going to come for a few moments now, and she's going to share with you a vision that the Lord laid on her heart of some of the future ministries that God might have us do to put this principle into effect. We have been blessed in our time in past history, many times over, but especially with how the community helped us in a time of tragedy for us personally as a body of believers after the fire, people blessed us and we want now to continue to not only be a blessing to this community as we're doing now, but we want to look for future ways during times of tragedy or disaster that we can be there for people and we can share the gospel of Christ. So Lori, if you'll come now and she's going to talk just a little bit about that and then we'll wrap it up. But I want you to hear the practical application of this for us as a church. Good morning. As Pastor said, my name is Lori Price. And one of the things that I want to talk about, um, Porterfield Baptist Church's stated mission is loving and leading people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. 
A big part of that loving relationship is to show that love through outreach programs. Programs that reach outside the walls of our facility here, that reach off campus, off of our property, and things that maybe even reach unbelievers, people that aren't even a part of our membership, of our fellowship yet. Uh, James, in, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 14, what good is it if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Now, certainly we can't work our way to heaven, but the deeds that we do should flow from our belief system so that we, we live our faith. Our faith is obvious from the types of behaviors that we do. One area of ministry that God has laid on my heart is outreach during disasters or emergency situations. I've been working with Pastor Mark and the mission team to develop what's called an on-site emergency outreach program, or for short, an OEOP. Um, this program would focus on ways that our church could live out our faith by reaching out to help other people in our community during their time of need. This would be a situation that would be where, for example, with flooding in perhaps the Belpre and Little Hawking area, where our church is not directly impacted or we're only minimally impacted so that we are able to reach out and to help others. Uh, some of the activities would take place right here on our location. A few of the activities, we might be the base and we would go from here out to do other things. But one of the main types of OEOP uh, outreach programs would be for our church to be used as a staging area, uh, particularly for first responders and others that would be coming into our community to work as a part of the disaster. Um, there's, these slides are just going to kind of be going while I'm talking. One of them shows some firefighters who are uh, laying on a sidewalk. Uh, that was their first break in 36 hours. And so that's what they had available to them for rest. As a part of the OEOP program, we would like to be able to maybe offer them a hot meal, offer them a place to come in and to just sit and rest for a few hours, maybe to get away from the uh, chaos of the disaster uh, scene and be able to come here and to rest a little bit. Um, we might also be asked to host a mobile pharmacy or I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, Tide detergent company, they have a mobile laundry facility trailer that they bring into disaster areas. Um, there I've seen mobile post offices and even temporary medical clinics where people who are involved in flooding, for the most part, they uh, need to get tetanus shots. And so these mobile em emergency medical clinics need a facility where they can be located so that then the word can be spread that members of the community can come to that location for assistance. Um, we've been asked by the health department and other agencies locally if our church would be willing to consider participating. We have not only a fantastic facility inside here where we can help people by serving meals or other things, but we also have this fabulous huge parking lot. And so in terms of a staging area, that's something that could be very valuable in an emergency situation. Another. Uh, option that we've been asked to consider is to be a volunteer reception center. In an emergency situation, a lot of times volunteers spontaneously come from many different areas, people who just really want to help. They feel called to help. On the other side of that equation, we have a number of people who desperately need help. And so being able to match those two up the most effectively and efficiently uh, as we can is a very important part of that. We want to make sure that Volunteers don't wander down into disaster areas and actually become victims who need rescued so that they're matched up appropriately. Um, we might also be asked to serve meals to volunteers if, if it's a situation where most of the restaurants in the area are either flooded or without power, there aren't many options. Um, I know a number of you and I worked this past summer over in southern West Virginia in the flooding. and. To have a hot meal, to have a clean place to sit down for a little while was a huge blessing. And that's something that we could do right here on our church grounds, our church facility. Another option, and you can kind of see in this slide, would be uh, working as a warming or cooling center. If we have a period of extreme weather, whether it's extremely hot or extremely cold, 
and then we lose power, a number of people can't stay in their homes, particularly the elderly or anyone that's disabled. They have difficulty with those temperature extremes. We would be doing this only as a temporary facility where, for example, people could come here and warm up or cool down while waiting for the permanent Red Cross shelters to be opened in other locations. So that this is another option that we're looking at. And then finally, uh, we have been asked to consider being a point of distribution. It might be food and water to, to, get, to make those things available to people who just don't have that available to them. Also, you can see in this slide, there are numerous cleaning supplies. Those were available both to residents of the community and also were available for the volunteers coming in to help to load up with those and go out into the community to work. This slide shows um, school supplies. Uh, our church sent a huge load of those down to Clendenin this past summer. Um, many, many homes were impacted. The children were getting ready to start school. The parents didn't have the money. And actually, there weren't even the stores right there where they could buy school supplies for their children. And so we sent down a lot of school supplies. And that church, First Baptist of Clendenin, was able to have an outreach program there where they provided those supplies to children in that area. So that's something else that we could look at. This is also a wonderful opportunity where we would be able to perhaps lead the way with other churches. Uh, we've all already had some other churches indicate interest in seeing how we put together this OEOP program, what we do with it, how it works. Uh, many churches in the area are considering getting involved in this type of thing. Uh, most of these activities would be done with minimal expense to our church. A lot of the supplies are donated or provided by outside agencies. They just need someone on the ground, someone locally who can help get those supplies out to the people who need them or open their doors so that those people can come in to get what they need. Um, we'd like to be as ready as we can to handle all types of these requests that we're getting. So what we're looking at is getting a, a small core group of volunteers who would be interested in getting some training and learning kind of how we set these things up and how we maintain these programs. The vast majority of the work would be done right here. That's the first O in OEOP is on site. So most of the work would be done right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Sometimes it's easy to talk the talk. But with an OEOP program, we're looking at walking the walk. We're looking at a way of translating our love for others into practical Christianity. We're looking at a way to put hands and feet to our church's mission statement to actually show Christ's love. Uh, an OAOP program would give us a way to show Christ's love, not just the love that he showed to each of us, the love that he showed through us, and also to make sure that others can start to see the love that he has for them and how we're a conduit for that to move into their lives. Thank you all very much. If you're interested, I'll tack on a little advertisement. Um, there's a sign-up sheet out at Carol's desk. If you're interested, please put your name and phone number on there. Uh, we'd like to get started as soon as we can with this program. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Lori. Good job. So uh, a lot of opportunities here, and uh, it's important because there are various ones of you here that are passionate about different things and different types of ministry. So again, if this is an area that really resonates with you, then we'd love to have you help. We're not trying to make those of you that are already involved in five different ministries have another ministry. It's okay, relax. <laughs> But if, if you are, aren't involved uh, to the point where you feel like you could give some time to this or it'd be a great way to, to kind of get connected with the church, we'd, we'd love to have you do that. It really is important what uh, Lori said because if we would have another uh, major type of uh, disaster event that would affect many people, the more churches, the more places that we can have designated for people to go, it helps to share the load, so to speak. And we've all seen when hurricanes and those types of things have swept through areas, 
the emergency shelters are just overwhelmed. There's, there's people uh, all over the floors with cots and stuff everywhere. Uh, in New Orleans, you know, after uh, the, the hurricane that went through there, uh, we saw the, the Superdome or whatever it was there in New Orleans, you know, it was, it was just a mess because even though that was such a large place, it couldn't contain all the people. So I love the idea that we could maybe begin this here, but be the lead to help other churches. So there's multiple locations that people know they can go to and how wonderful to know that they can come to the church, which is really the people, it's not the building. They can come to Christ. They can come to those of us who love Christ and care about people and we can help them in their time of need because we have been blessed to be a blessing. We have been saved so that we can serve. We have been helped so that we can help others. Jesus taught this principle in Mark 10, 45. He said, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And in Romans 12, verses one and two, some of his followers, his early followers, set the example as well in following the example that Christ set. And the apostle Paul writes this to the church in Rome, Early on, he said, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now, obviously, he wasn't talking about literally, physically offering your body as a sacrifice to God and slaying yourself. He was talking about living for God. That's why he says here, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So live sacrificially to Receive the blessings God's given you, but then look for ways as you enjoy those blessings to also share them with others in ways that are meaningful and that help them in their faith. And then he says this, this is your spiritual act of worship. As I mentioned earlier, we worshiped during our time of singing and with music. That's often equated with worship, but you are worshiping right now with me. I am worshiping God because I know his word to be true I've experienced the effects of his word in my life and how it has challenged me and disciplined me and corrected me <laughs> and helped me. And I'm worshiping God now because I am sharing with you because worship means worthship. What is something worth to you? And actually you are worshiping God right now because you are listening, you're paying attention, you are showing that what is being spoken is important and that is showing worship to God, so thank you for that. God appreciates that. But then beyond that, we need to not only be hearers of the word, we need to be doers. So we also worship God by how we live our lives every day. Every day is a choice. Will we share blessings in ways that are meaningful with others? So I'm gonna close with this scripture today. Lori read from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 that talks about love, true love is shown in action. And this is the second letter written to the Corinthian believers, second Corinthians chapter one, verses three through five. And you've heard this passage before, but it's good to hear it again. Praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Did you hear that? What did God say at the very beginning? The scripture I shared with you, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. And then as we have experienced God's help, even though maybe he didn't answer our prayers in the way that we wanted or things didn't work out the way that we wanted, as we trust God, one way or another, he's gonna bring us through that trial, that storm. And as we have experienced his presence in our lives in whatever form of deliverance, challenge, struggle, and the things that we've learned for it, he's also preparing us. He's blessed us. He's saved us. He's helped us so that we can help and serve and bless others. God who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And then he says this, for just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives. So that's the reality of this, folks. Trusting Jesus isn't an easy road. It is not an easy road. There will be suffering. There will be pain. There will be difficulty. But Jesus said, take courage. I've overcome the world. I will help you through that difficulty, through that trouble one way or another. Because even if we don't make, 
it through the difficulty with our physical life, if we've trusted Christ, we have eternal life. We are sure in him. He holds us secure. He will deliver us. But just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. And that's what I'm here to tell you very honestly and frankly. Life is tough. Even as a follower of Jesus, I've experienced it. We've experienced it here in this fellowship. But God is good and he will help you through and he will help in ways that are amazing and he uses people to do it. Sometimes from some very unexpected sources. But God is still the one who orchestrates it. And so we have been blessed to be a blessing. So with that, we need to offer God thanksgiving. We need to be willing to pay our vows, so to speak, or put God's word into practice. And we need to glorify him with our lives. So here's three closing questions for you to consider. Uh, just go ahead and put them up there. If you've been saved from your sins, how are you serving God? What are you doing with that new life that God has given you and that forgiveness and grace? And if you've been helped, how or who and how are you helping others? And then if you've been blessed, how will you choose to be a blessing to others? Those are some things that I'd like for you to think about this week. And it's things that we all need to think about collectively as a body of believers, as a church, as we move on into 2017 and beyond. This absolutely is a year of opportunity for all of us, no matter what situation in life you're in. If you're going through a very difficult time and a, a tragedy in your life, it is an opportunity to experience God's grace and to learn and grow and to perhaps head a new direction. Uh, and if you're being blessed right now, then don't be selfish with it. Look for ways that you can enjoy the blessing, but then also help others to enjoy it as well. Should be willing to share. That's part of our vision for the Upward Sports Ministry, the development of, of the field over there and future plans, which I believe will tie into what God has put on Lori's heart uh, and shared with you this morning. So would you stand and thank you again for worshiping with us today, for being here. And as we close with a, a send-off song, it's always an opportunity for you to reflect on what you've heard, reflect on your relationship with Christ, whether you have one or not. And if you would like prayer this morning, you're always welcome to come up. I'd be happy to pray with you, or if you just want to spend some time in prayer, let this time minister to you and let the Spirit minister to you. Father, now as we sing this song, help us to be open and sensitive to your Holy Spirit lead and how you want us to respond. And thank you for the blessings that you've given us in our lives. In your name.